I normally don't pay attention to product releases, but this one intrigued me. What is immutable storage? I knew I wasn't alone in the confusion, so I asked the expert. Brought on Brian Helwig of MSP360, this is a bonus episode of The Business of Tech. So you got my attention because you guys put out a press release and it was very product related. And my longtime listeners know that I don't tend to latch on to product relations, but uh, releases and, and product information. But in this case, I had this bit of, I think there's a, why do we care here that might be a little bit bigger. And I wanted to understand because from a technical perspective, I actually admit I don't understand the technical solution. And so my thinking was, is, well, if I don't understand it, I suspect I'm not alone in this. So help me understand how immutable storage works. It's a really simple analogy for those of us that are a little kind of closer to our age. Um, you probably remember the days when there was a tape and you maybe recorded or dubbed a favorite uh, tape from a friend from you know one to the other when you say play and record at the same time. And when you were done, whether in the VHS days or any of the case may be, you would snap that tab off and you were no longer able then to write or change that, right? Mm -hmm. And how you would fix it is you would put a piece of tape over the top and then you could use the tape again, right? Right. I remember those. So immutable, (laughs) yeah. So immutable storage or object lock, what it essentially does is it sort of breaks that tab and doesn't allow for that storage or those files that are inside that storage to be touched, overwritten, or updated. It literally puts them in a vault until a timer goes off, and then you put the piece of tape on, and then it's able to be deleted or updated. And so that's what happens with immutable storage. It's literally just the way. And actually, in today's day and age, for those that are a little bit younger, I have one of these uh, USB, you know, sort of, fun, fantastic uh, SD cards. There's a switch on those that does the same thing. It prevents it from being writable. And it's the exact same technology, but just in the cloud. Now in the cloud though, if there's a switch, can't this be undone? Isn't that like a, isn't there a security risk or a theoretical problem where if I could flip that switch and then not be immutable storage, isn't that an attack vector? So actually, it's not as easy as you think. Okay. Um, once something like governance or immutable storage is turned on, um, you have to go through almost a very manual and literally like a phone call and verification process to go through turning it off. So there are, it's a whole new level of verification. It's not just calling an API or logging into a a, a platform or a screen and just checking the box off and hitting save. Once you check that box, you literally almost have to make the phone call to Amazon or Wasabi and say, hey, I'd really like to disable this. And they say, cool, don't know if we know who you are. So let's start going through that identity verification process. And that's what makes it even harder. It's not impossible. And I want to double check. So this isn't based on something like the the promise of the blockchain, right? Because I keep hearing that if I do this on a blockchain, that I've got an entire auditable record and it's completely undo. This isn't that? I don't even think anything, even the blockchain. I mean, eventually somebody will come, right? Fair enough. Right? You, 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 you lock it up and you do the best you can. And then does somebody, you know, come up with a way to do a little better or to get around it? But in this particular situation, it's about 99.9% locked. It's very, very hard to remove it. Okay. Very hard. All right. So actually I'll I'll, I'll give you an analogy that's even, it's actually easier to create another bucket with it off than it is to go and try to disable the object locking on the bucket that exists. Does that make sense to you? So it's almost, yeah. So you almost have to just go create another bucket and push your data over the copy of your data over there. And then wait for this one to age out or cancel the account and t- you know call Amazon and say, I, but the whole account gone, whole bucket gone, everything gone. You can't just really, it's, it's very difficult. All right. So before I get into to sort of advanced thinking, isn't there a basic problem here of, well, if I'm never deleting anything, storage will get 
really big, really fast, and this become very expensive. When I gave the example, I said there's a point in time, there's a trigger where the data becomes eligible to be deleted. Okay. Okay. So that bucket, so let's say, for example, you want to hold on to a piece of data for seven years. Mm -hmm. And it's sitting inside an object locked bucket on seven year and one day it unlocks. Kind of like a time lock safe at a 7-Eleven. Okay. Right. You can only, when, once that happens, you press that button, you have to wait a period of time. So you push the, push the object up. You say the retention schedule seven years. It's going to sit there for seven years and on day one. After seven years, it becomes eligible to be deleted, and then you can delete it. Or if you say, hey, I want to keep it for a month, or like a lot of our customers that are using immutable storage and object locking today, they are using it as a protection mechanism to say, hey, I have a base image that I'm always going to have, and then I'm going to keep this, and I'm going to do the incrementals, and then I'm going to keep three versions of those incrementals, and then once I have that third version, the, when the fourth one comes up, the third one is eligible, if you want to call it that, to be the first one's eligible to be unlocked. And then the, the purge script comes through and that first object is removed. Okay, so let me make this then practical in the field because the obvious direction this should go in is the security play, right? It makes sense to me that if I've got something that theoretically can't be removed, I should be protected. So here's the premise. Tell me what your reaction is to this premise. If I'm a customer and I'm backing up using immutable storage, and let's say I'm at some level, I'm willing to turn that up pretty high, right? Like I want to retain six months worth or a year's worth of, of storage. Pretty much I should be in, I would be in a position then where I would be able to tell ransomware hackers that I'm not going to pay the ransom because in theory, I would, would absolutely have a backed up copy. And while I would have to take time and energy to restore, I don't have to, I could, I can always roll back always. What do you, what's your take on that premise? That, that's actually the whole reason why it was, you can kind of say invented. Okay. Right. Object locking was pushed to market specifically because if you look at traditional backup, old school backup, what did you do? You put it on a tape and you send it underground, right? Right. Iron Mountain would show up. When you have a storage media that can be overwritten dynamically on the fly and you don't have a way to protect it, then you're susceptible to any kind of locking, you know, encryption, corruption. Another way, as a simple example, for a hacker to be able to manipulate cloud storage and cloud backup platforms is they would go in and just literally edit the backup job to only have one version and then save it and then run the backup job. And then that night everything gets deleted. Then they go in and they corrupt it and they come back. Right. right. That's the play. <laughs> so, right. And so um, this, what this does is, is actually two parts. One part of our technology is you're not able, you're allowed to enable a way where objects cannot be deleted or edited on the endpoint. So then you have to go in, you have to use two-factor authentication, Google Authenticator, whatever it might be, however you're going to do that to be able to get into our platform to then go ahead and be able to edit the job. Then we have an arc, we have a uh, audit log that tracks who edited the job when and where, but let's say hypothetically they get in, right? They get in, they're on our platform, you have immutable storage turned on, that immutable storage is there, you can't adjust that period of time. When you set it, that object is going to exist inside that framework and that in, in that storage media for that period of time. Without a significant amount of manual effort to change that, that's where it's going to sit. So they go and they change the jobs, they run it, and it's going to go, and it's going to push up that version, right, one version, mm -hmm. but it's not going to delete any of the others. And so then they go in and they hang the, the post-it note, and the post-it note says, hey, give us a million bucks. You're able to just say, restore and you just pull all the data back. Okay, so every engineer who's listening is screaming, it's never that simple, there's always a problem. It's never, yeah, there, that's right. <laughs> so so that's where right. where is the area where you've got, like it isn't just a set it, forget it. What are the things that you need to put in place for an immutable storage solution to be able to make that guarantee of you will not have to pay the ransom? What do you have to put in place? Actually, the it's very, very simple what you have to do, okay. right? It, but, but the practice of it is sort of what becomes harder. Um, most often uh, what happens is you have your first image up there, everything's running, it's great, right? It's, it's set, everything says perfect. And that image is restorable. 
the incrementals, sometimes people put data in the wrong place, right? They save it in the wrong place. And whether or not if you're just going to store or just look at a couple of different file folders rather than um, an entire image, that's one issue that comes up. You just don't, they decide to put it somewhere else. There isn't anything you can do to capture that. Taking the human factor out of it, the next as aspect of it is, and we encourage MSPs to do this all the time, is just to use 321. Just because immutable storage is out there, right? If something happens in flight between the source and the destination and a file you know, is going through a reconciliation process and it, it doesn't check out and we're trying to uh, back it up again and as, it's, as we're cycling through, you usually have a local copy, right? So your local copy is off-site. So that local copy is happening. So you can back up to multiple locations with our software at the same time. So you can push to the cloud, push to local storage. And then, you know, having one offsite gives you that added uh, protection that, hey, here's, here's the tape underground, for lack of better words, right? Um, the other thing is you just have to test your backups. We have, we do bump into teams that are like, hey, everything is great. Everything looks good. Um, the consistency check works. All the file sizes match up. Everything you know, is, literally checks out exactly the way you expect. They go to run a backup and or restore as a test. And it turns out that there is a file that may have changed or may have been um, in the consistency check. It comes back and says, hey, it looks good. But the configuration is different because the original source machine was different. And so they'll have a hard time spinning it up on a new, right? So if I have a, a, call it a server that's a, a two core, or I'm sorry, a, a two socket, and I go to a server that's four socket, Sometimes a configuration or like a, v, a hyper V image or a VMware doesn't necessarily always come over as, effi as efficiently and effectively as you like. So just making sure that your DR practices are in place and you do the practice of the restore. We actually are working on a technology that's going to allow the MSPs here this year to be able to do that automatically. So we're going to help them eliminate that test and just send them a snapshot of that screen starting in the cloud so that they know it's configured right, it's running in the EC2 instance, okay, and you'll be able to bring it back and go, hey, we know we're good. Um, that's, I mean, that's really it. I mean, as long as you have an, a copy sitting outside of your four walls, you know, even if it's once a week you're doing that and you're storing it, to, you know, pull, disconnecting it from a system, um, chances of you recover, losing more than one week are very, 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 very small. Fair enough. So what makes the way you guys are doing this unique? Because again, I'm not, a, I'm not looking at this as with deep expertise. I'm looking and saying, well, they're leveraging Asabi and, and Amazon's capability. Isn't that just something that they flipped on? What, what have you guys brought that's, that's, that's unique to this? The unified billing play, which is our platform, right, completely integrated. So, so first and foremost, Amazon, Backblaze, Wasabi, they all have some form of object locking or immutable storage. And one of the great things about our platform is you can use the same features and function, integrated or non-integrated, and you are going to pay the same price with the exception of Amazon. So where we're unique is our platform with AWS, it, our unified billing platform has no egress, no API, no download. It's flat 23 bucks. Not even Amazon offers that to their customers. And that partnership has just really grown in a way in which we're able to say, hey, let's give the MSPs best-in-class storage with, you know, the guys that basically invented the cloud and then turn around and layer on top of it a predictable pricing structure that they understand, that they don't have to worry about. And that's why we, we that's what we did with Amazon. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of The Business of Tech. If you like it, hit the like button and hit that red subscribe button. It really does make a difference, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I'm doing. You want to discuss more? Want to find out more about the interview? Go ahead and put something in the comments. I read them all, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. If you want to get content like this every single day, the five-minute Business of Tech podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are found. Go to businessof.tech, click the blue subscribe button. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Additionally, if you want to help me with the content that I create, you can support me directly. Go to patreon.com slash MSP radio and click the button there. You choose what the content is worth and get access to these interviews and discussion episodes early. They come out for my Patreons, and Patreons drive the discussion and ask questions directly. Looking forward to ongoing conversations, and thanks for watching.